old and I'm from the Netherlands. Ciao, my name is Antonio Marsi. I am 29 years old and I am from Italy. Ni hao, my name is Ying Jie Qi. I'm 32 years old and I'm from China. My work studies monetary policy in economies with domestic and international production chains. I'm interested in the interaction between monetary policy and financial stability. My research is on the role of information choice in macroeconomics and finance. I'm interested in finance and development. I do research in banking and copy finance. My work is about the policies of the European Central Bank which directly affect the risk premium on the sovereign debt of peripheral countries. I study how long-term investors change their bond holdings after a shift in regulation and how these changes subsequently affected interest rates. I found that savers choose to get more information about which bank or product they should use for their saving in recessions. My work explores how voter preferences determine financial regulation, focusing in particular on the role of political connections in this process. Welcome back to the ECB Forum on Central Banking. Forum participants, please do remember to cast your vote in our Young Economists competition. But now it's time for our first panel discussion, which will be dedicated to issues related to the ongoing review of our monetary policy strategy. And it is my pleasure to introduce Philip Lane, member of the executive board of the ECB, who will be joining us remotely today. So Philip, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Scary. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, as was just indicated, actually, uh, Sintra 2020 is, I think, an especially important edition of, of, the, of this series because uh, it's right in the middle of our strategy review. So uh, we taught this year, uh, both in terms of the design of the topics that are being covered in the academic sessions, and now in these uh, panel format, it was important to try and cover you know, a wide range of topics that relate to strategy reviews. So, so in this panel, we've collected uh, three topics which of course are interconnected. Uh, one is, if you like, uh, structural forces. So this morning, uh, we've, or this afternoon, I should say, uh, we already have had a very important and interesting sessions on globalization and climate change. But of course, there are other structural forces such as uh, digitalization, automation, the ongoing uh, structural, uh, long-running structural trends of the economy, for example, the trend uh, transition from manufacturing to services. And of course, uh, in the background, we, we, we have the demographic transition, the aging of the population uh, uh, globally, uh, the, the kind of movement in the average rate of productivity growth. And of course, uh, within the f financial world, the, the uh, rising demand for safe assets which if you take those together, one way those structural forces uh, will you know, influence our world is through uh, low equilibrium real rates. So uh, you know, these forces uh, influence how the economy operates. It influences the transmission mechanism of monetary policy. And it, it is also, I think, an interesting question to debate about whether it also influences the optimal uh, target for central banks. Does it change how we think about the, the anchor of our monetary policy in terms of the type of inflation aim 
we should have. Now, of course, uh, in addition to that, I mean, whether it's for the effectiveness of monetary policy or more simply for any public institution, a core value should be transparency and openness. Central bank communication is, is so important. So I, I'm very hopeful that we're going to have a very interesting panel. Uh, the format is we have three, I think, outstanding monetary economists. Uh, we're going to take them in the order of uh, Jordi Galli, uh, Volker Wieland, and Annette Vissen Jorgensen, uh, just from the composition of the grant they're going to cover. Uh, each will have 10 minutes uh, to, to make their opening contribution. After that, uh, we'll go to the raised hands uh, from, from the virtual floor, and I'm looking forward to an engaging uh, Q&A interaction. So with that, uh, let me hand over to Jordi Galli. Okay, good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, Philip, for your introduction, and thanks to the ECB for inviting me to participate in this uh, great event. Um, so let me jump uh, right into the, my presentation. Um, I'm going to address the issue as to whether the ECB should revise its inflation objective. Uh, this audience needs a uh, little background on the, on the subject, but let me just mention that um, the inflation uh, target of the ECB was set uh, in 1998 to be a year-on-year -year increase in the HICP for the euro area of below 2%, and that was clarified in the uh, review of uh, 2003 to be uh, below but close to 2%. Now, what was the justification at that time for setting an inflation target uh, that was positive, uh, given that the mandate that the ECB had was one of price stability. And the justification, similar to that of other central banks, was, uh, well, first, that there was some measurement uh, biased in inflation, and also that um, by setting a positive inflation target, the ECB would maintain a safety margin against the risks of deflation. And there were two types of risks of deflation that the ECB was uh, pointing to at that time. First, deflation in each member country, given the likely structural inflation differentials within the euro area due to different, maybe different growth rates of productivity. And also a risk of deflation in the euro area as a whole with a consequent um, risk of hitting the, the zero lower bound, the ZLB, and hence, um, making it harder for the, for the ECB to, to stabilize inflation and output. Well, it turns out that the first um, risk of deflation has been hardly a problem in practice. Um, uh, there, have been ver are, there are very few cases of uh, negative inflation differentials on average over the, the life of the uh, euro area. Only four countries have maintained a negative inflation differential, Germany, uh, France, Finland, and Cyprus, and that infl negative inflation differential has been relative, very small, actually, uh, uh, less than a minus 0 0.3 percentage points. Now, of course, the risk of um, a def deflation in the euro area and the risk of hitting the zero lower bound uh, uh, has been uh, has materialized, as we as we all, all know. Now, at that time, when that inflation uh, target was set. Um, um, there were a number of studies conducted within the ECB uh, and which are um, just, um, uh, were published as in a volume um, uh, called Background Studies for the Monetary Policy Review, which uh, concluded that the available evidence suggests that inflation objectives above 1% provide sufficient safety margins to ensure against the risk of hitting the, the zero lower bound. Okay, obviously, that, uh, that prediction was uh, far uh, too uh, sanguine, and the assessment uh, at that time, of course, with the benefit of hindsight, may have been distorted by a number of factors. First, the recent experience uh, uh, may have caused a bias in that assessment because, you know, the, there had not been uh, a large um, deflationary uh, shocks in the euro area for, for, for a long time. And also, at that time, there was no evidence uh, of uh, no discussion of a, of a decline in R star, the neutral um, real interest rate. 
In fact, in the background studies of uh, the Monetary Policy Review, review in, in 2003, a baseline value for R star of 2% was, um, was used in a number of papers that made up that, that, those uh, studies. And uh, as it was discussed at that time, that estimate of 2% was at the lower end of historical estimates, okay? So it was viewed as a conservative, uh, a conservative um, value. Of course, uh, many things has, have happened uh, since then, um, and uh, now there is a widespread uh, agreement among academic economists as well as policymakers that um, the long-run neutral rate, uh, R star, has experienced a, a substantial decline in, 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 in recent years. And current estimates for the euro area are um, systematically below 1%, and many of them are actually uh, negative, even negative. Now, the factors be be behind the decline in R star are well known. They, they are largely structural, long-term factors that uh, are unrelated to, 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 are not caused by monetary policy. They pertain to lower productivity growth. Uh, aging of the population. Now, the COVID crisis may uh, may only uh, make uh, that the, the trend uh, more, more more steeper uh, to the extent that it raises um, the, the, the possibility of recurrence of, of such pandemic shocks, uh, increases uncertainty, and uh, hence increases precautionary savings. Um, now, the main implication of the decline in R star is that given an unchanged strategy that there will be a higher incidence of hitting the zero lower bound or the effective lower bound, okay, and hence more frequent episodes of that sort. So what one would think was needed in response to that uh, change in the environment was either an adjustment upward in the inflation target given an unchanged rule or a modification of the rule given an unchanged inflation target or, of course, um, an, an adjustment of both the rule and the target. Now, uh, I'll take uh, some minutes to, to, to show you the, the findings of some work in, in progress that were conducted with, conducting with Philippe Andrade, Hervé Levihan, and Julian Materon, uh, in which, uh, which is based on an estimated medium scale model for the euro area, and in which we conduct a welfare-based analysis of the optimal inflation target given alternative monetary policy rules and uh, under the constraint of a, an effective lower bound of minus 0.5% for the policy rate. Now, the main focus of that work, and the one I, I, I will concentrate on in, in, in here, is the relationship between R star and the optimal inflation target conditional on alternative uh, policy rules. So let me show you. Um, a picture that uh, uh, summarizes our, uh, our main findings. What you see here is on the horizontal axis, uh, the um, assumed uh, value for R star, okay? And on the vertical axis, the optimal inflation target delivered by the, this welfare-based analysis uh, based on the estimated model for the euro area. The dashed lines correspond to um, to the historical estimates of R star, and you can see a value of 2.6%. And it turns out that the model delivers an optimal inflation target, which is about 1.7%, actually close to, but below 2% in that case. But obviously, this value of 2.6% for R star is clearly obsolete, according to current estimates. Okay, so we can see that if R star uh, is below 2%, uh, the, you, the optimal inflation target would Im, uh, immediately uh, uh, rises above uh, 2% for a value of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of our star um, close to 1%, the inflation, uh, the inflation target, the optimal inflation target is closer to, to, to 3%. So it calls for a large adjustment upward in the inflation target, such a decline in our star. Okay. Now, of course, there are there are ways of, of, of avoiding um, that the need for an, inf an increase in the inflation target, and those are cha the, that uh, take the form of uh, or that would involve changes in the in the monetary policy rule that would shift the schedule that you see on on on, on the screen to the left. Okay, that would make it possible, you know, to to maintain two percent or a value close to percent as an optimal inflation target in consistent with or coexisting with a much lower uh, R star. So let me show you two such uh, rules. 
Okay, one is average inflation target, uh, uh, targeting a version of which has been adopted by the Federal Reserve recently. And here we consider two um, uh, possibilities, one uh, more aggressive than, than the other. So um, in, in both, in, in, so the blue, the blue line corresponds to our baseline simulation, in, which assumes an, uh, a conventional um, uh, Taylor type uh, rule. But in the, in the yellow uh, line, here we assume a Taylor rule that responds not to current inflation, but to average inflation over the past four years. And in, in, in the turquoise uh, line, we, we assume a rule that responds to average inflation over the past eight years. So you can see that shifts the schedule to the left and uh, the eight year, uh, the rule with an eight year memory actually makes it possible to maintain an inflation target close to 2% as an optimal target, even for an R star of 1%. Um, here we have a, a, an, an alternative, um, an alternative deviation from our baseline uh, scenario. Here we allow the fiscal authorities to respond with an emergency fiscal package whenever uh, the output, the cumulative output gap is uh, reaches 6%. And the, the, the fiscal response is 4% of GDP. And you can see that it, this achieves, this is a very aggressive counter-cyclical fiscal policy that achieves a similar, a similar um, objective. Okay, to, to, to reconcile a 2% inflation target with, with a low, much lower R star. Okay. Now, um, now, these three, um, let me just briefly um, discuss these three uh, options. So Counter-cyclical fiscal policy, of course, it's, uh, it's beyond the ECB's control, and it would involve the, the, the need to, to allow for to, to escape clauses in this stability and growth pact to, 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 to operate uh, effectively. Um, uh, and most importantly, I think it, what uh, this would require is to uh, prevent at uh, all uh, costs the, the, the need or the, the imposition of uh, a large fiscal consolidation programs at, in, in times of recessions, the way the, in contrast with what we observed during the, the, the financial crisis. Uh, of course, we know that the, the fiscal policy is beyond the ECB's control, but of course, uh, the ECB's views are important on this matter. And uh, during the financial crisis, one uh, has to say that uh, there was maybe too much uh, cheerleading for, the, for an aggressive fiscal consolidation at the time when this uh, could uh, hurt the economies very much. Average inflation targeting is um, easy, of, um, easy adoption, and it can only help in the short run because, it, if anything, it may raise uh, exp inflation ex uh, expectations, and, and by doing so, may raise inflation itself. I view it uh, just as a formalization of uh, forward guidance. Now, an important caveat is that it, uh, its benefits hinge uh, critically on the workings of anticipation effects and on the ability of the, of the ECB, in this case, to steer inflation with high precision to the desired levels. Now, given the flattening of the Phillips curve and the recent experience, one may you know, have some doubts about, uh, that, uh, about that ability. Also, deviations from rational expectations may also uh, um, uh, call into question the workings of those antis the needed anticipation effects. Higher inflation target, on the other hand, is robust to deviations from rational expectations. And the only caveat that one can see is how that transition from the current undershooting would take place. And from that point of view, what I, I would suggest is to, to follow uh, an approach that emphasizes gradualism and opportunism, gradualism in the sense that the, the ECB could now announce that sometime down the road, in the, in, in, in sometime in the future, it may consider adjusting the inflation target, okay, so that the, it is clear that the current inflation target is not uh, set in stone forever, and also uh, the principle of opportunism, which calls for implementing that new inflation target at a time when inflation has reached or is very close to the new inflation target, not at a time when its uh, inflation is much lower than, than, than the target as it, as it is now. Now, the three margins are not mutually exclusive, and one may want to exploit them uh, simultaneously, and that may be the safest uh, uh, way to go. So just to conclude my, my presentation, let me say as, a, as a final remarks that um, it's very important to think of uh, a monetary policy framework 
as a framework that is built on some assumptions necessarily. It's not it's not out of the blue. It's not built in, 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 in or designed in a vacuum. Now, when these assumptions are revised, the framework must be adjusted. There is one key assumption that was uh, made when the, the current monetary policy strategy was uh, designed that has been revised, and that's the level of R star. Okay, so that calls for a, a change in the framework. Otherwise, one must recognize the consequences of not adjusting it. In this case, would be recognizing and, and making it clear that uh, the incidence of zero lower bound episodes with its consequences on, on, on deflationary consequences and on output, uh, consequences on output instability uh, will, will increase in the future. Now, making the current inflation target symmetric is clearly not enough for that purpose. It's obviously a, 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 a correction of uh, what to many of us, it uh, seems like just a, a minor anomaly, but it's not enough. And a change in the target or in the rule seems warranted. I'll leave it at uh, this. Thank you. Th th thank you, Jordi. Uh, um, so let's move uh, straight across to, to Volker. So over to you, Volker. Thank you. It's a pleasure to contribute to this uh, session. Uh, my discussion starts from a quote by President Lagarde, uh, where recently she said, uh, or she explained that uh, we've observed a persistent decline in inflation. In the euro area, annual inflation averaged about 2.3% from 99 to 2008, but only 1.2% from then to 2019. And that we should analyze the forces that are driving inflation dynamics and how to adjust policy strategy. So that's what I'll be uh, addressing directly. Uh, looking at averages of inflation, I think it's interesting to split the period uh, since 2009 uh, in two parts, namely the double recession uh, till 2013, you know, the euro debt crisis followed the global financial crisis and the recovery. And what you observe is actually that HICP inflation remained high. So in the first period, close to 2%, 1.8, and then it went down to 0.9 during the recovery, which is a bit odd because you think in a recovery, inflation starts rising. Uh, if you look instead, at uh, prices of all goods and services produced in the euro area. So that's the GDP deflator. Uh, it makes no difference before the financial crisis, about 2%, uh, but it went down during the double recession period to 1%, and it went up on average uh, in the recovery to 1.3%, at least something. Um, and where is that coming from? Uh, if you look at import prices, well, 1.6% before the financial crisis, in the double recession period, 2.1%, and minus 0 0.3 during the recovery. So the CPI that the ECB is looking at was held down by import prices, uh, while if you look into the GDP deflator, you see some effect of the ECB policy and the uh, recovery. Now, going forward, here is the uh, time series. You can actually see that for the um, GDP deflator, so the domestic price inflation, um, it's very similar pre-crisis, uh, pre-financial crisis. But since then, it was low in the double recession and rising back to the target which the ECB designed for the HICP in 2019, so domestic price inflation at 1.8% in 2019. Um, at least something uh, worth looking at, um, uh, I think, uh, and to consider in the uh, strategy. Uh, there are other measures of inflation uh, which are not fully covered in the HICP. If you think of households, a big uh, part of expenditure is on housing, on your home. And uh, of course, there are rental costs excluded, included in the HICP. Uh, here you see the orange line, it's pretty flat. In those periods, here it's the HICP excluding energy, right, where it's low, uh, rental costs held up, but they, were, uh, they are underrepresented in the HICP because a lot of housing is, you know, self-owned, so it's owner-occupied, and that's not uh, covered or it's not even a, a rental equivalency is not included. Um, if you just look recently at owner-occupied uh, housing indices, for example, in Germany, um, this rose uh, between three to five percent uh, in the last uh, three, four years. Uh, so that's 
exclude it, but it definitely affects uh, um, people living there. Of course, partly it's an asset price. The land is gaining more value, but also construction costs. So it's just becoming more expensive. Uh, it's more variable, of course. Uh, in France, it's a little different, but these are issues to look at. There and are issues which give thought that maybe inflation is higher than measured by the current HICP. For technical reasons, it may be difficult to include in the HICP directly, but uh, it's something in the strategy the ECB could start looking at. I'll come back to that. Uh, looking forward, I think it's of interest. You talked about climate policies a while ago. Um, Today, uh, looking forward, uh, you know, this climate policies will also affect prices, will also affect the HICP. Here's a study from staff of the German Council of Economic Experts, which tells you the effect uh, the new CO2 pricing for heating and mobility will have in Germany, uh, probably more than 1% on the, on the HICP in 2021, and then quite a bit also in subsequent years, and about one third of that will be on the euro area measure. Of course, that's not just inflation, that's actually probably a cost push up. So it's a new dimension I can't touch on here. But uh, different, definitely issues uh, to look at in terms of the strategy. Now, coming to the policy dimension, I think it's important uh, to take into account the actual policy instruments used. I'm not sure that was fully into uh, Jordi's analysis, but what happens is when uh, we hit the effective lower bound, policy switches from interest rate or brings in, in addition, quantitative easing. Of course, the quantitative easing effects are uncertain. Uh, if they're not uncertain, if quantitative easing would be a perfect instrument, then can, you can hit uh, the inflation target independent of what happens to our star, but it's not perfect, it's uncertain. Here's a simple linear process. Uh, if you look at inflation here, uh, this is the affected by interest rate deviations from the equilibrium nominal rate, the I star, that involves the pi star, the inflation target, and the R star Jordi talked about. Uh, but also inflation can be affected by quantitative easing. Here, this parameter B measures the impact, uh, and that may be quite uncertain. So uh, over here, there's some parameter uncertainty, and the sigma B, the variance, accounts for that uncertainty about the effectiveness of quantitative easing. And of course, where we are in terms of inflation, uh, inflation expectations also, but also where we are. So lack of inflation affects where we're going. So uh, let's look at the simple process. Uh, let's look at a policy which tries to hit the target. Um, so minimize uh, expected square deviations of inflation from target. That has two components, right? You wanna get the expectation of inflation on target. That's what uh, Jordi talked about, uh, but also the variance of inflation is involved, right? So the variance of inflation is influenced when you're uncertain about the effects of your policies. We may not be so uncertain about the effect of interest rates, but definitely in terms of quantitative easing. And then as long as you don't hit the expected lower bound, which is not zero by the way, but as long as you don't hit, uh, hit it, so if the interest rate remains above this ILB here, um, basically here you can implement this optimal feedback rule. I've made this very simple. You can make it dynamic. You can include expectations. Here it's very simple. And basically uh, the normal interest rate deviates from the equilibrium rate, right? Here it's R star plus pi star. Whenever inflation is away from the target, right? You lower when inflation is below, you raise when inflation is above. All this time, uh, under this policy here, uh, the quantitative easing stays at zero. You don't use the quantitative policy. And as a result of the optimal policy, expected inflation is equal to the target. Now, when you're hit by a shock or inflation is very low, right, then uh, what happened? Okay, then we're here at the effective lower bound. So if inflation here, lack inflation is low enough, like what you can see here, it can be defined numerically, the interest rate will be at the lower bound and policy can switch. And we've observed that in uh, many jurisdictions to quantitative easing. Uh, so there is a new feedback rule. You see, it's the same element. You, you feed back, you respond to inflation deviations from target, accounting for the effect uh, you get from the interest rate being at the lower bound. But there's an important difference. If you look at the feedback parameter, it's different. It's not one over B. It doesn't uh, nail it exactly. There is an attenuation factor because you're uncertain about the impact of the quantitative easing. Uh, you, you respond uh, by less, right? This is positive, this is positive. 
So the, uh, basically, uh, the coefficient is smaller. As a result, actually expected inflation is below target. So the message you get from this is at the effective lower bound, it may actually be optimal to have inflation converge more slowly to the target from below. Why? Because of uncertainty about the effects of policy, um, about the quantitative policy, which I'm not sure was included in Jordi's analysis. Uh, there is a second um, reason why you may uh, choose that route. That's because there may be risks of side effects of quantitative easing, right? People have worried that when the central banks ramp up their asset purchases, that this creates risks for the fragility of asset prices, or that it creates risks uh, on the uh, banking, uh, in the banking system, on the in terms of interest rate risks, uh, or fiscal dominance risks, whatever. Uh, a very simple way here to include it, um, this is my side effects variable. Q here, the quantitative easing. C is the potential risk of side effects. So I'm taking the position, no side effects are expected, but so the parameter is zero, but there's some uncertainty, right? It could be different from zero. Uh, what happens then? Well, if you include the side effects in the policy, you get a second interesting trade-off, namely in response um, here to putting some weight on the risk on, on the side effects. And what comes out is that the uh, reaction function for quantitative easing changes. It looks the same, but here the reaction coefficient is different, right? There's a new element. There's the, the sigma C, the potential risk of side effects in there. So that reinforces uh, the trade-off and basically uh, is another reason why it may be optimal uh, for, you, for you to converge uh, slowly uh, to the target from below. Now, um, concluding uh, in this simple framework, I've included the constraint on interest rate policy, the effective lower bound, but I've also included a monetary policy response, quantitative easing, which has been used extensively. Um, and then let's look at now the choices, the other strategic choices, how they affect the uh, effective lower bound. Now there is a Plus, so it means this is a non-negativity constraint, but it doesn't mean that the zero low, it's a zero lower bound, right? There's an ILB, which measures how far below you can go. Now, as Jordi rightly pointed out, if the R star, now I've broken down the I star in the equilibrium real rate and inflation target, right? If the R star goes down, interest rate policy is gonna be more constrained. That's certainly correct. Now, in terms of the pi star, it's a little tricky. I mean, Jordi is absolutely right. On average, or if you start from steady state, it gives you more room. But when you are already at effective lower bound, as we are currently, uh, and then you announce a higher inflation target, uh, basically you also widen the distance you have to cover. And this requires immediately even easier policy. So it's a little tricky at this point, uh, only if you have an immediate massive impact on inflation expectations, you gain more room. Uh, if you're a little more uh, taking into account that inflation is a sticky process, uh, it's actually a tricky issue. On the other hand, something the ECB has done in contrast to the Fed, exploring where actually the lower bound is on the short rate or medium rate, right? The ECB is now implementing TLTROs with minus 1%. That makes policy less constrained and it works one for one to the R star. So yes, the R star may have come down. That's still a bit more uncertain. I didn't mention that research, but it's a bit more uncertain than it sounded with Jordi. Uh, but yes, assuming it came down, we also got more room uh, than we thought uh, when we did the studies in 2003. Um, and finally, if you look at inflation measurement, I think it pays off not to focus only on the HICP, because if you uh, think of inflation being closer to the target, of course, that also effectively means either giving more room or effectively means that policy is having a bigger impact. Concluding, what did I want to say? Well, in terms of strategy, I think it makes sense to consider inflation measures and more inflation measures more broadly in policy communication, not just the HICP. Um, and actually, it doesn't need a massive change in the strategy. Currently, uh, there is an objective of below but close to 2% regarding the HICP. And that, that could be uh, interpreted as a range, for example, 1.5 to 2%. Uh, something used by others. But a range always gives you flexibility. And in this case, it gives you flexibility in policy communication to also point out what's happening with other inflation measures. Uh, 
Finally, just to summarize, at the effective lower bound, it may be optimal to have inflation return to target more slowly from below due to uncertainty of the effects of monetary policy, quantitative easing, and potential side effects. Uh, raising the inflation target, yes, that can help, but it's tricky when you ride at the uh, effective lower bound. You may want to explore other options, other instruments, just as quantitative easing, maybe other instruments. Um, and uh, if actually, uh, the lower bound uh, was not as uh, binding as we thought back in uh, 2003. Uh, so that's an issue to consider. By the way, it's also something in terms of side effects of QE. Uh, a lot of banks complain about how negative rates affect their profits, particularly in Germany. I always tell them, look, uh, you make profit normally on uh, borrowing short taking deposit at short rates and lending out long, you would more easily make profits if you have a steeper term structure. So don't complain so much about the negative short rate, uh, but I'll leave that for discussion. So that's my points. Uh, thank you for uh, giving me this time. Okay, uh, thank you, Volker. Uh, let me, before I just turn over to Anes, uh, just make the point for those of you who are thinking of questions or who want to offer comments, uh, raising your hand in a virtual format doesn't cost you anything. Uh, it, it's not going to cost a lot of energy to keep the hand up. So I'd encourage you because it makes it easier for us to, to uh, form the queue of, of people uh, who want to make a contribution. Uh, the quicker and earlier you raise your hand, uh, the better. Okay, with that uh, pr pr proviso, let me turn over to, to Annette. So over to you, Annette. Thank you very much for the opportunity uh, to speak about central bank communication. Today, I'm going to try to convince you that informal communication, including what I'll call unattributed comments, play a central role. Uh, by un unattributed comments, I mean comments that people don't put their name on, uh, sometimes referred to as off the record or on background or not for attribution. I show, I'll show you some facts, then I'll talk you through the benefits and costs of using this kind of communication as an institution or as an individual policymaker. And then I'll finish with some suggestions to reduce the use of unattributed communication, including a discussion of recent ECB efforts. So here are the three facts. Uh, the facts uh, argue that information flows from the Federal Reserve to the stock market at unexpected times, whereby unexpected I mean times where there's no formal Fed communication in the form of releases or speeches. The first fact is from Luca and Munch. They used data post 1994 to document that the average US stock return in the 24 hour period from 2 p.m. to 2 p.m. before and not including the announcement was about 50 basis points. They view that as a puzzle since monetary policy news coming out would have had to be systematically positive. And this is part of the blackout period and they view leaks as being unrealistic from an institutional viewpoint. The second fact is from just like Morris and Vincent Jorgensen also in post 94 data. Uh, there we show that uh, looking over the whole cycle in between FOMC announcements, that stock returns over bills are much higher on days that fall in even weeks relative to the announcement. You can see that in the left graph here, which graphs the average five-day excess return on stocks over bills against the number of days since the FOMC meeting. So not only, as we know from Luca and Mink, is there high returns right around day zero or just before the announcement, but there's an additional three quite strange looking peaks in these uh, average realized returns. Now, in the paper, we argue that this pattern actually is due to monetary policy news. Uh, a key argument for that is that prior to 1994, intermeeting target changes were common. There were about two thirds of the changes actually, and they reveal the timing of when the Fed does its thinking and its decisions. And you can see in the graph to the right that using now the pre-94 period, the target changes are more common in these same even weeks uh, in FOMC cycle time. So um, the graph shows the five-day probability of a target change graphed against the number of days since the FOMC meeting. Now, we argue also that over this post-94 period, monetary policy news actually was systematically positive. For example, Fed funds futures yields fell on average in these even weeks, and even week stock returns were particularly high after low prior returns. So that would be consistent with a surprisingly strong Fed put. We link the even week timing back to the timing of the frequency of discount rate requests from the reserve banks. Uh, those are ways for the reserve bank to affect uh, policy making. They have to be made at least once every two weeks, which would make 
a bi-weekly decision or discussion frequency me meaningful. The final fact I want to talk you through is from a new paper uh, by Morrison Missing Jorgensen, which is based on a freedom of information request for the calendars for calendars of Fed governors. Based on six calendars and data since 2007, uh, we, cal we categorize uh, as many as, I think, 30,000 calendar items into many different categories. And it turns out that the interactions between the governors and the Reserve Bank presidents are what's tightly linked to information flow to markets. So we document that these even week returns are particularly high on days where the governors and the presidents interact, either at the FOMC events or in private phone calls and meetings. And that's even more so if there's informal communication, either via on the record public commentary uh, using FOMC speak data or via on background media, media interviews uh, for which we obtain data from the governor's calendars. Okay, so that rules in the role for informal communication. And as I said before, all three facts are unaffected by controlling for form of that communication. So I want to focus my, the rest of my comments on unattributed communication since you know, a lot has already been said about the public cacophony. So a bit more evidence for this kind of communication. The, you may remember actually that the FOMC statement emerged in 1994 after congressional pressure for transparency uh, after a series of newspaper stories revealing Fed information. Furthermore, if you read former Governor Meyer's book, he notes that the use of reporters as part of the Fed's signal core is not official board or FOMC doctrine. The public affairs staff and the chairman like to pretend it doesn't happen. I put a quote here from a top Fed reporter, Greg Gibb, uh, saying, you know, he does lots of on background interviews with the Fed. Finally, I have in another paper documented many uh, discussions of uh, leaks in the FOMC documents, so in FOMC transcripts, although I'm going to argue in a second that these are not leaks, many of them are not leaks in the traditional sense of the word. All right, so how does monetary policy communication normally work? Is it in this unattributed way? Well, no. Uh, remember in the standard framework, communication is for accountability to sustain independence and also for policy effectiveness in the sense that the impact of forward guidance and QE and longer term interest rate depends on the public understanding that these, play, these policies are going to be in effect for some time. So in that framework, communication should be public and on the record. So why might uh, central banks or central bankers use unattributed communication? It could either be from the perspective of the institution or it could be from the perspective of an individual. So let me talk through each of those in turn. So starting with the institutional use of unattributed communication, uh, I think we can learn from political science what the benefit of this might be. So uh, Posen 2013 uh, documents that many White House, leaks, White House leaks are not leaks in the traditional sense revealing unauthorized information. They're more authorized plants of information in media outlets. These plants allow the sender to, quote, impart information about ex executive branch policies without officially acknowledging those policies and thereby inviting unwanted forms of accountability or constraints. So let me map that to central banking. So in our world, communication to some extent ties policymakers' hands if the public doesn't fully understand that policy is state contingent. Perhaps in that setting, unattributed comments retain a bit more flexibility than public communication, though of course, less than no communication at all. Furthermore, explaining policies without attribution or in background avoids time-consuming public debate and unattributed communication may be a convenient way to gauge support outside the central bank for a particular policy change. But there are also costs. Most importantly, I think, a loss of credibility. Unattributed communications is clearly the opposite of transparency and accountability. Today, we are part of an ECB listens event. There's other listening events before that. Let's ask ourselves what the newly engaged citizens would think if we told them that there's a lot of use of this kind of communication and that, and that it has big effect on asset prices. I suspect they would be a bit worried whether they're uh, pension fund managers doing well in that uh, information game with others. A second cost is that once the institution uses unattributed communication, that facilitates use by individual policymakers in the sense that when there's less formal guidance about the, cons the evolving consensus, that leaves a bit more room for the individuals to try to move market expectation. Now, as you can see, there's pros and cons of using this kind of communication for institutional purposes. I'm going to argue, though, that it's used for individual policymaker purposes is clearly welfare reducing. So, so let's turn to that. So 
you know, as we all know, there's lots of disagreements between individual policymakers. And I think uh, in that setting, communication is not only institution, but also individual. So it becomes about driving market or public expectations in order to improve your bargaining position in policies, policy negotiations. Uh, there's different ways one could try to do that. Posturing is one approach. Um, that just means making firm statements of what policy you prefer to make opponents think that you're not going to budge in negotiations. Uh, that's probably best done through on-the-record communications in speech or interviews. Another approach would be influencing, so try to convince the public that you have some good arguments, or perhaps even spin, which is a little sneakier and involves distorting the public's assessment of what the likely policy decision is. Now, critically, if the information used for influencing or spin is confidential, then it has to be done using unattributed communication. We can think in our context as central bankers of staff protections, internal deliberations, and so forth that are often con confidential until a decision has been made. So let's just do a two slide version of how this game works out between the different uh, policymakers. Um, I'm gonna call this the quiet cacophony uh, since it's done uh, unattributed. So think of two policymakers who are choosing what to reveal to the public about their policy preferences at an intermediate date in between policy decisions. They care about not being viewed as flip-flopping uh, in the sense that both will incur a loss if somebody is com communicating and the chosen policy rate is, deviates from market expectations formed based on any disclosure. So if nothing is revealed, if no one reveals information ahead of the meeting, well, then they can set the policy rate equal to the average preferred policy rate across the policymakers. But if someone communicates, now their hands are partly tied and the chosen policy rate is going to be a weighted average of what they prefer and what they have made the market expect. So let's assume that the policymakers can, within limits, of course, spin market expectations or policy preferences by selectively revealing information. Okay, so think here of the hawks would want to reveal the hawkish internal information and conversely for the dogs. One can then show quite easily that if there's enough disagreement relative to how much news might arrive before the policy meeting and sufficient spin is possible, well, then there's a unique national equilibrium where each policymaker is going to be communicating with his or her preferred spin in order to uh, improve their bargaining position. Therefore, the spin cancels, assuming there are equally many hawkish and dovish arguments to, to let out there, but each are worse off from a lost uh, policy flexibility relative to non-disclosure. You'll see that this is exactly the same as a prisoner's dilemma, where both prisoners would be better off if neither confessed to get a reduced sentence, but both confess in equilibrium. Now, in the, in the game, I'm assuming the spin cancels entirely. One could think of cases where there's only information going one way. In that case, the conclusion remains in the sense that each side will gain as often as they lose, and they still have a loss from flexibility. I put here two recent disclosures of ECB staff projections to illustrate to the left a dovish and to the right a hawkish leak. The dovish leak says ECB projections to show future growth barely above 1%, thus underpinning the ECB's plan to approve more stimulus, and the more recent leak um, to the right is a hawkish one. Now, there are other costs to unattributed individual communication than lost flexibility. It damages, again, the credibility of the central bank I put a quote from Bernanke stating that, and also important, there's harm to the decision-making process, both in terms of collegiality, but also importantly, information withholding in order to prevent leaks. A Reuters article in 2014 noted that several ECB sources said that Draghi had cut back on circulating policy papers, papers in advance of council meetings, apparently out of concern that opponents, notably the Bundesbank, were leaking them to try to block a discredit decision. So let me finish up with a couple of, of simple suggestions. So first, I think it's important to resist communicating through these very expensive Fed Watcher, ECB Watcher newsletters, whether for institutional or individual reasons. Of course, it's easy to talk to experts and they can move market expectation quickly, but so can the best financial newspapers. Thinking back to the Medley scandal at the Fed back in 2012, this was very harmful to the Fed's reputation because it reinforced perceptions of unequal access to information after all, the newsletter is 120,000 per year. And central bank independence, of course, especially in these times, is not something that we can take for granted. My second and final suggestion will be to stop this prisoner's dilemma of disagreement-driven unattributed communication by seeking consensus. Okay, so 
there's a very nice Reuters article from earlier this year describing how President Lagarde is doing precisely that, putting a great emphasis on consensus, giving more voice to critics, more time listening, more time for deliberating, in return asking for discipline or to keep internal disputes out of the media. This maps very nicely into the standard solution for the prison's dilemma, which is to consider a repeated game of the version with quote unquote punishment. Uh, the consensus building fits very nicely into this in that now the president has something to remove, namely influence, if discipline doesn't follow. Of course, it's hard to identify who's leaking, but I think with an improved culture, uh, leaking is less acceptable among colleagues who may know the identity of a potential or actual leaker, and therefore colleagues can help informally discipline those who may consider leaking. And I put a quote from, again, political science that while leaking is, leakers are rarely disciplined in public, uh, they are often disciplined informally. I'll finish it there, thank you very much. Very good. Thank you, Annette. Um, so uh, the way we're going to run this panel is we're going to go straight to q and I'm going to take a, a few questions together uh, be before returning to the panel members. Uh, so uh, I'm very pleased to see on my, the first list uh, in front of me, uh, my former colleague, uh, Vitor Constancio. So first of all, over to you, Vitor. Thank you, Philip. It's a pleasure to uh, be able to uh, participate. My point is about the Vocals proposal to uh, have more than one uh, price index to assess the objectives and the performance of monetary policy. To those uh, indexes you mentioned, one could add, uh, of course, the index for core inflation, which has been most of the time well, uh, well below any uh, reasonable uh, target. But uh, the point is that this would be detrimental to the anchoring of inflation expectations. And one of the objectives of going back on the review uh, of the objectives and the strategy in general for uh, major central banks, as we have seen with the Fed and now with the ECB, is precisely the point that the underperformance in uh, reaching the target over so many years uh, is affecting inflation expectations anchoring and that there is the risk that there is an unhankering of inflation around the target and that uh, uh, expectations could be anchored at a much lower level than what is uh, desirable. And that, of course, uh, uh, will make it much more difficult for policy to uh, normalize toward the target, the, uh, the inflation level. Uh, the other point is that uh, uh, precisely because of that, uh, the uh, decision that the Fed made recently to go for flexible average inflation targeting is very well justified because is an enhancement and a new commitment of the central bank that uh, will aim at uh, uh, inflation during a number of years above target in order to offset the previous underperformance. And this is more than just being symmetric, is really adopting a policy towards that uh, averaging inflation targeting, which uh, was very nicely presented by Jordi, uh, and uh, that uh, 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 showed uh, that, in my view, uh, central banks should go for the longer period of uh, averaging without fixing the number of years. My question to all members of the panel uh, is the following. What is your assessment in terms of the effect uh, in uh, uh, anchoring inflation expectations, the proposal by uh, Volcker, to, uh, to uh, uh, use several price indexes, both to define and assess the objective of monetary policy. Thank you. Okay. Th thank you, Vitor. Uh, next, I have uh, Klaus Adam. Yes, thank you. So I have a question that would relate um, to all three panelists, and uh, it regards um, the form that the inflation target should actually take. There seems to have been some disagreement and there's also some um, sort of let's say uh, fuzziness in the way ECB has uh, up to now defined the target with a 
price stability zone between zero and two and the target or objective somewhat close to but below two but not precisely defined. Now Jordi seems to have advocated, if I understood him correctly, a single numerical value and Falker seems to have um, favored a zone of indifference uh, based on the argument of flexibility. And I was just wondering, you know, how the panelists would sort of uh, relate to the following concerns, namely that for one, um, a zone would be somewhat harder to communicate, and it would also, uh, given the results of Annette, um, leave uh, room for individual communications and disagreements uh, in the background to that about where exactly in the zone we should be anchored. And it is also probably less good at pinning down inflation expectations and at detecting potential deviations um, from uh, the pinning you know, of uh, inflation expectations. So I would be curious to hear uh, what the panelists think about what form the inflation target should optimally take. Thank you. Thank you, Klaus. So again, uh, in, in gathering uh, this round of questions, uh, let me turn to uh, my colleague, Ignacio Visco. Ignacio? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the insights, which will be very helpful also in our strategy revision. And I will not say much on that, but I would like only to, to make a, a similar point to what uh, uh, put forward by Vitor. Hello. Do we can hear you, Vitor, or Ignacio. Do you hear me? Yeah. Do you hear me now? Hello. Yeah. Yes, okay. No, uh, do you hear me, Philip? Sure, absolutely. You're perfect. Okay. No, because I got a message which was confusing. Okay, thank you very much. But uh, what I was saying is that similar to what uh, Vitor has said, uh, uh, Volcker's proposal or derivation that uh, perhaps the convergence to the inflation target should be uh, slower uh, when uh, when we are at effective lower bound uh, misses the point that uh, if this is so then uh, there will be an effect on inflation expectation that is a procrastination of going back to a to the target may at the end feed back into uh, maintaining inflation expectations de-anchored and therefore making the uh, convergence more difficult rather than uh, rather than uh, possible. The, the, the other point is that also in Volcker derivation is that there is uh, in your point an uncertainty about the effects of QE on inflation. Uh, but um, the issue here is also to take into account the effects that QE has on the macroeconomy at large. Uh, if there is no prejudice to, uh, uh, to price stability, we have to uh, favor the uh, improvements of the macroeconomy, the reduction of uh, financial instability and so on, and therefore that should be taken into account in measuring the effects of uh, QE. Uh, finally, I share instead the point that uh, if we are uh, far away from the target, then uh, Jordi proposal to uh, raise perhaps the inflation target would uh, have some effects on credibility, that is the possibility of uh, reaching the target might be uh, considered to be more difficult. And again, this might feed back in the reaction of the economy. Uh, indeed, I think that perhaps in um, Jordi uh, framework, the inflation target could very much be path dependent rather than being fixed. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ignacio. Uh, next, uh, Alan Blinder. Okay, am I unmuted now? Yes. Okay, good. Well, uh, thank you very much. I just, in, in two seconds, those were three really fascinating presentations and thank you all. But I have a particular question for uh, Jordi about uh, average inflation target. So in the, eco in the economic literature, uh, what's now called average inflation targeting is a close cousin, if not almost a twin uh, brother to price level targeting. And the idea is to tighten up the grip, so to speak, of the central bank on, my screen just went funny. Am I still on, Philip? Yeah, we, we can hear you, Alan, please. Okay, okay. 
uh, to tighten up the grip on inflationary expectations and indeed and especially to drive them up when they're too low and that is preventing the central bank from getting up to its target. So my question has to do with flexibility, which could also be called vagueness. The Federal Reserve adopted this uh, idea, sort of, recently, but in an extremely vague way, so that nobody knows over the, what period inflation is supposed to uh, average 2%, how quickly or slowly the FOMC intends to approach those higher levels when necessary, and so on. And some of us, not obviously not the consensus on the FOMC, some of us think that vagueness makes this, um, really undermines the basic idea of average inflation targeting. So that's my question for Jordy. Okay, thank you. I think it makes sense given um, the, the uh, t time. Uh, we're gonna run over a little bit. Uh, but I have two more on my list. So I'll take these two last questions and then I'll return to the panelists and you can basically decide how you want to, to respond. Uh, so, so, so next, uh, I have uh, Gilles, Gilles Moet. Uh, hello, Philippe. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks a lot to, to the three panelists. Um, I have a question actually to uh, Volker uh, and his point on inflation measurement and is, is focus on uh, introducing uh, or raising the weight of uh, house prices in particular uh, in, the, in, in the measurements. Um, would you agree that there would be also a case to look at another source of divergence uh, between uh, inflation perceptions and measured inflation? For instance, you could consider that hedonic prices, the hedonic correction to prices create a divergence between measured inflation and the way it's perceived by households. Uh, why shouldn't we look at that? Obviously, it would take it in the other direction. It would actually raise the prospects uh, of beginning deflation. And I was wondering if, if Volker would agree with looking at it in this symmetric way, rather than just focusing on something that would make uh, the inflation measure go up. Thank you. And thank you for, for, for that. Okay, so, so the, the last question um, before we have to close it, just for time interest, is uh, Harold Ulick. Harold, over to you. Yeah, thank you. I wonder whether the time has come to go to price level, price path targeting as, as, a, as a communication tool. It's the, it's the further development from inflation targeting. It's a bit like inflation averaging, but maybe a bit more precise. One could announce a price path. One could also announce how speedy one wants to get to that. I mean, that, that would imply if an undershoot sometimes one overshoot some other time. When Egerton and Woodford proposed this in the Brookings paper in 2003 as a powerful tool to address issues at the zero low bound, people thought at the time, this is something that's too hard for the central banks to communicate and that inflation targeting is simply easier to communicate. But now we have gotten you know, forward guidance and all the rest of it seems to me that that will be the logical next step to take. I wonder about that. And it's a question mostly to Jordi and to Falcon. Okay, thank you, Harold. So um, now I'm going to come back to the panelists, but I suppose in the tradition of running panels, I'm going to reverse the order. So, so first of all, uh, Annette, uh, whether any of the questions you got there or anything uh, you heard from your fellow panelists you would like to, to add to. Yeah, I want to agree with both Klaus Adam and Ellen Blinder that any sort of vagueness in what the central bank's mandate is or what the specific goals are uh, is going to result in just in finding a disagreement and complicated communication. So I would agree that we should pick something a little bit easier to communicate for those reasons. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, Volker. Thank you for the questions. That's great. Um, the mandate is price stability inflation. So it's the ECB's choice what measure to pick. And the question correctly pointed out by President uh, Lagarde is why has HICP inflation been so low? Uh, and that question has to be explained. What are the forces behind it? Um, and uh, as you saw from, from the comparison between domestic price inflation, uh, which is, has been rising, and the HICP, that it must have to do with import prices. So uh, I think, uh, um, Vitor uh, Constancio, I think we have to look at that. You know, we want to have an answer to what's going on and not just say, let's just look at one thing and no matter what happens. Uh, the other thing which is good about that is because it actually gives some hope 
that uh, the policy easing by the ECB, which has heavily relied on negative interest rates and quantitative easing, has had at least some effect domestically. And by the way, domestically are a lot of rigid prices, sticky prices, which New Keynesian theory tells us uh, that's why we need uh, inflation targeting or, 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 or price stability. Uh, so I think uh, it makes sense in a strategy review to look at broader measures. Uh, to Klaus, I did not necessarily say that, or also to Vitor and Klaus, I did not say that we need to switch the inflation measure. I just pointed out, or I didn't mean to say that we need to switch to a larger range. I just pointed out that the current system uh, gives you some flexibility, and that should not be totally disregarded or kicked out. Uh, at least we should uh, note that it has some advantages. Back with Orphanides, I did a paper on optimal inflation zone targeting. There can be some good reasons also related to the trade-offs in the Phillips curve, but I just wanted to point out this new trade-off that you can actually better communicate uh, what else is going on with inflation uh, by other measures. Um, so that's that. In terms of inflation expectations, well, inflation expectations are what they are. People will do their best to figure out what the measure is going to be that they're looking at. If they think that they have to forecast the HICP, and this is important for some reason because of some contracts, they will forecast the ECB, uh, sorry, the HICP. And if the HICP is actually driven by import prices in the euro area in the recent years, they will forecast that the HICP will be lower. So this is not necessarily a signal that policy has been ineffective. And so it can only help uh, if you do the best you can to explain all the uh, sources and effects going on. Uh, in terms of average inflation targeting and price path targeting, yes, I think price paths and price level targeting, I think in terms of models, I've looked at that also in 2003, um, this can work quite well, but it requires a lot of credibility. And the problem with price level targeting is that um, it may uh, be fine now when the question is to basically keep um, policy rates low, lower longer or keep the easing more aggressively. But at some point, uh, we might end up abo above the price path, and then it will be hard to communicate why, or to raise rates, to keep on raising them, or to, to come back to the path. So uh, that's the problem. But I think it's, an, it's, it's a very interesting uh, strategy to discuss. In terms of the question on perceptions, I agree we need to look at household perceptions. Um, and, uh, and my understanding is there's quite a bit of research that they somehow perceive much higher inflation. Um, so there is a lot of explaining also to do uh, where we can get better. So apparently the, re the strategy where the ECB only talked about one measure of inflation hasn't really uh, gotten all the way through to households. So there is some education to do. Thank you, Thank you Volker, and uh, over to you, Jordi. Yes, um, well, very interesting questions. Let me go quickly over some of them. Um, on, I, I, I would definitely not uh, support the idea of having an alternative uh, um, in the sense of several uh, inflation, um, inflation um, measures that uh, the ECB should target. However, I sympathize with Volcker in, in the sense that the HICP is not necessarily the, the best, uh, the best one. I think some measure of domestic inflation, uh, in particular, um, uh, um, I would say more than domestic GDP, the domestic uh, GDP deflator uh, inflation, uh, core GDP deflator inflation that, uh, you know, uh, uh, ignores uh, the um, items that uh, that are subject to to large fluctuations would be a more desirable a more desirable uh, practice. This is particularly true, to 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 be honest, from a theoretical point of view, for economies that are small, for which you know uh, import prices uh, may distort uh, a lot the the HICP. But uh, I, I think as uh, I think it, it should apply uh, to the ECB. Now I'm. I'm I'm skeptical that a change of this sort would be adopted at the ECB or any other central bank, given that everyone seems to be focusing on uh, HICP. The only exception, though, is the Fed that looks at the core um, consumer uh, deflator, um, which is closer to what Volcker is saying. Now, um, Klaus mentioned uh, the form of inflation targeting. I mean, in our research, we we just uh, derive what the optimal inflation target is, and that's just one number. But I, for communication purposes, I think that it would not be a bad idea to 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 
establish a, a, a band, it could be a narrow band, and more than anything to make precise what the ECB believes, uh, it, uh, it, uh, what, what the ECB means by, uh, um, by being close to the target. Okay, so in addition to having a, a, a symmetric uh, target, I think having a, a, a band that would make that a bit precise, what is meant by meeting the objective or being close to, to the target, I think would be a, a good idea. Um, on price level targeting, the problem with, uh, of course, uh, price level targeting is just an extreme, it's the limiting version of average uh, inflation targeting where when memory goes to, 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 to minus infinity. The problem with um, price level targeting is that in the real world, uh, it may not work as well as it does in, in our models in which there's full credibility, rational expectations and so on. And with price level targeting, a period like the one that we have experienced in which inflation is persistently um, um, it can be persistently below uh, the target and, and substantially below the target may call for um, um, uh, reaching inflation levels persistently above the target that uh, may not be credible and that the central bank may think twice about trying to, to implement those. So having an um, uh, average inflation targeting um, puts a bound on, on the extent to which that will be necessary. And that's why I think it's more, it's, it's more desirable. So a four year or a six or eight year uh, average inflation target, I think would be desirable. Also, it doesn't have to be a strict targeting. The, 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 the ECB should not try to hit that target no matter what, okay? The idea is it would be a reference point that would guide its, its decisions. I agree that the, the the Fed uh, announcement on average inflation target was, uh, I guess, uh, trying to be flexible. It was uh, vague, and that's probably why it didn't have much impact, uh, much impact on on on, on markets. Uh, I think it would be important to be, uh, if if uh, the ECB were to adopt uh, average inflation targeting, it would be important to be a, a little more precise, in particular, on what the relevant horizon is, so that. Uh, you know, people can actually compute what's the what the what's the relevant relevant average inflation um, at each point in time that had that has to be uh, compared to 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 um, to the target. And like just one one thing to conclude. And Annette's um, I, I I thought Annette's presentation was very interesting. Now. Um, I'm not sure on her on her recommendations at the end. Uh, Annette, you were calling for. Uh, or you were pointing to the importance or the desirability of consensus in, in such an environment. Uh, you know, consensus, of course, sounds like a very nice word, but also consensus, depending on how it is implemented, uh, leaves much less room for, for, for policy, individual policymakers to express their views. And that uh, either before or after policy meetings, and, you know, that may also be um, harmful from many points of view. Uh, Okay, Th thank you, Jordi. Uh, Annette, I mean, because you, you, you didn't use up too much time earlier on. I don't know if you want to uh, have any reaction uh, to that or. A quick reply to Jordi. So I think that individual policymakers should definitely express their views, but they should do so, you know, on the record and in public. And that's a very important part of the debate. And that leads to great decisions. What I'm arguing against is all this kind of behind the scenes stuff or you talk to Reuters, I talk to Bloomberg. I think very little good can come of that. And we should try to clamp down on that. And um, and I think consens building more consensus means that everyone has a bit more at stake in, in kind of upholding good norms. Very good. Um, so let me uh, just close by saying we're in a ECB listens mode. So of course, uh, there's so much uh, uh, covered uh, in this session that uh, very much uh, we will be we are dis discussing internally, but it's fantastic to have uh, external voices participate. So let me thank the panelists, uh, and of course, in every conference, uh, overruns uh, happen. So I do apologise for overrunning a little bit, but I think uh, that there was uh, no loss of efficiency there. Uh, all the material was so rich; uh, it was worth the overrun, at least from my point of view. So with that, uh, let me hand it back to Sierra. Uh, and again, to thank you to, to all the panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Philip. Thank you very much to all the panelists, all the participants. Certainly a very stimulating debate, um, which is concluding our program for today.
Um, two points of info, the videos of today's session, along with the papers, the various presentations, are being made available on the ECB website, so do keep an eye on that. And do also please remember to submit your questions for tomorrow's policy panel, which will feature Christine Lagarde, President of the ECB, but also our prominent guests, Jerome Powell, Chair of the Federal Reserve, and Andrew Bailey, Governor of the Bank of England. So please do send in your questions uh, via the Twitter hashtag ECB Forum or for participants using the dedicated email channel. Well, at this point, the point uh, I want to make is that the forum will resume tomorrow at 2 p.m.